Now for our uh, second reading, let's uh, turn again to that passage that we've been considering in Hosea and uh, chapter 5. We'll read the passage first, Hosea chapter 5, and uh, reading at verse 10. The prophecy of Hosea follows uh, Daniel and Ezekiel, or Ezekiel and then Daniel and then Hosea. Hosea 5.10 The princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark. I will pour out my wrath on them like water. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked by a human precept. Therefore I will be to Ephraim like a moth and to the house of Judah like rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent to King Jerob, yet he cannot cure you nor heal you of your wound, for I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. I will take them away and no one shall rescue. I will return again to my place till they acknowledge their offence. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. Come, and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, on the third day he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Let us know, let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. His going forth is established as the morning. He will come to us like the rain, like the latter and former rain, to the earth. May he bless the reading of his word to us. And again, let's uh, focus particularly on the words that open chapter 6, an exhortation. To come and let us return to the Lord, for he has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken but he will bind us up. So come and let us return to the Lord. And we'll take our final look at this text tonight. And of course, as we've seen, its overall theme is repentance, or as the Hebrew word, uh, turning. It's all about turning or returning to God. And uh, you'll remember from This morning and indeed from last week that there are four parts to this repentance, which we find in the text. Uh, Last week we saw the first part, which is our sin. That's implicit in the words of the text itself. Let's return to the Lord so we have turned away. And we saw how both Israel and Judah had turned away from the Lord. This morning we saw God's chastisement or his corrective discipline. He came to both Israel and Judah, first of all as a moth, and then at last as a roaring lion. And after visiting them like that, and that's a reference to the terrible destruction they faced at the hands of the Assyrians first and then the Babylonians, after that we read that God left them, I will return again to my place. Now tonight we're going to see the third part of repentance, which is the turning itself. Let us return to the Lord. And uh, last of all, God's healing. Because if we do come and return to the Lord, the text assures us that although he has torn us, he will heal us. And although he has struck or stricken us, He will bind us up. So our turning and God's healing. Now, uh, as I said, when we left this in the morning, uh, God had torn them, 
bows like a lion, after some time gnawing away at their comforts like a moth, he had torn them as a lion and then left them. At the very end of chapter 5, I will return again to my place, God says, till they acknowledge their offence. Now that expression, uh, I will return again to my place, means that uh, God took away his comforts from them uh, altogether because they had grieved his spirit. And the New Testament reminds us that that is a, a reality under the new covenant too. The operation of the Spirit of God is essentially the same under both covenants in the Old Testament and in the New. And if we grieve the Spirit of God by whom we are sealed until the day of repentance, the the day of redemption, then the Spirit will leave ourselves too. Now, he doesn't leave us utterly. He never does. The seed of God will always abide in the true child of God. You cannot become a child of God and then not a child of God. So when the Spirit leaves his people, he leaves them in the sense of withdrawing his helps and his comforts. And that is a terrible thing to experience. I I made a reference in the morning to Samson when he, um, of course, flirted with sin. And uh, when he got out of it, he shook himself when he got out of the Uh, the trap that had been set for him and uh, thought that he would fight the Philistines as before, but he knew not. He did not know that the spirit of the Lord has departed from him. And of course, that is a very solemn thing, not just that the spirit of the Lord had departed from him, but that he didn't immediately know it until he somehow put it to the test. But that, that departure of the Lord's spirit from him meant that he was found shortly afterwards uh, grinding corn for the Philistines, um, with no eyes, in total darkness, uh, doing the work of a donkey. The the man who had used the donkey's jawbone to kill Philistines in his strength was the man now because of sin who was reduced to doing donkey's work. And he had become a laughingstock in the eyes of the Philistines and in the eyes of the world. Now that's what God's departure does. And that's why it's greatly to be feared. I've, I've said this so often before. When we distinguish chastisement from judgment, we distinguish rightly. They're different things. But we're never to think of God's chastisement as a light thing. His people can pass through very, very difficult experiences under the chastising hand of God. So let's be careful in our lives. Let's be careful not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Now, you'll notice from that text, the last verse in chapter 5, if you have, as I hope you do, always your Bible open in front of you, God says that after he has torn them, I will return to my place until they acknowledge their offense. And then they will seek my face in their affliction. They will earnestly seek me. Now, That until is comforting um, because God's people will return and seek his face. But the until may also cover a long time. We don't always know how long it takes for people to acknowledge their offense. And uh, that is relevant for nations and for individuals. Take, for example, Judah. She was taken into captivity at last. God, like a young lion, uh, tore the house of Judah. It took the best part of 70 years for that nation to repent properly from the top to the bottom of the nation, from the rulers and the nobility uh, to the common people, the best part of 70 years. If you're to turn to the nation of Israel, it's even more staggering than that. It's taken 2,000 years for that nation to recognize their offense and to look on him whom they have pierced and to mourn for him. Paul tells us the mystery that this nation that rejected the Lord will actually return and be engrafted again 
into the tree from which they were cut off as branches. But thus far it's been 2,000 years, a long time. Uh, but we remember that a thousand years with the Lord is as one day, and one day as a thousand years. And it may be there have been for many years now signs that this nation is ripe for turning. But with individuals, it can be the same. Some people may lie for weeks or months under the chastising hand of God. Uh, I referred, and, and we sang about David there in Psalm 51. You'll remember that he was nine months under the severe hand of the Lord's chastisement. And it was a severe hand because his sin was so severe and it was so public. It involved murder. It involved humiliation. It involved adultery. It involved the disgrace of the Lord's cause. And so for nine months, he felt like he was a dying man. In Psalm 32, that's how he felt. He felt as though he was dying until he turned back to God in real repentance. We'll see that in a minute. But it can also take years. There are some people who have lain for years under the chastising hand of God until they really acknowledge their offence. And you may be in that category. There may be aspects of your life that are still okay, but there's something still wrong because the chastising hand of God is still upon you. And you have never known, perhaps for several years, that fullness of communion and that freeness of access to God and that a joy in your spirit and comfort in the Holy Ghost because of something amiss. Something amiss. But however long it takes, it will come back. And the people of God will turn back. They will acknowledge their offense and they will see God's face. And in their affliction, they will earnestly seek the Lord. And that's the turning that we have in the specific words of our text in chapter 6 and verse 1. Come and let us return to the Lord. I think the best way to understand the speaker here is as, as though it's the people of God speaking to each other and exhorting each other. You'll notice that it's after the affliction because he has torn, it says, but he will heal. He has stricken or he has struck but he will bind us up. So after their suffering, uh, here's a call issued to them to come and let us return to the Lord. So it's not God speaking. It's not even really God addressing them through the prophet as such. It's just a recognition in their own hearts that they are all to come and to return to the Lord. So these are the words of Israel and Judah. And they follow on from the last verse of chapter 5. If you think about it, it's very straightforward like that, where God says, I will return to my place till they acknowledge their offense. Then they will seek my face, and in their affliction they will earnestly seek me, and here they are doing it. Come now and let us return to the Lord. Let's seek him. And let's seek his face, which means let's seek his favor again. Let's seek his approval. Let's seek his fellowship. Notice again, by the way, that those who seek the Lord are the Lord's people. They are the true seekers, the true Jacob, God's true generation, those who are seeking the Lord. Now let's look at this return or repentance. And I want to look at it with you in a slightly different way. And uh, I'd like to look at it with you in the light of our catechism's definition of repentance. Now, I don't, uh, as a rule and on principle, preach from our confession or catechism because they, they are helps. They don't take the, the place of the word of God. But nonetheless, it's useful to bring in uh, their definitions from time to time. And the question on repentance, like every other question in the Shorter Catechism, is well worthy of memorization. The question is, of course, what is repentance unto life? In other words, a, pen, a repentance that really reconciles us to God, a, a living thing. 
a living turning rather than a dead one? What is real repentance? What is repentance unto life? And here's the answer. Repentance unto life is a saving grace. In other words, not a common grace. It's a special saving grace that God gives, whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin, notice these are the motives to repentance, so a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension or awareness of the mercy of God in Christ doth or does with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. Now that's a really comprehensive answer to the question, what is repentance? Repentance is not just an accurate answer, it's a comprehensive answer. It takes in really everything. Now, as I was studying this, I made an unexpected discovery. Well, it was unexpected to me anyway. Maybe others have noticed it before, but I was looking at the proof texts um, underneath every question. Most of you will know that the Confession of Faith and the Larger and shorter catechisms have proof texts uh, underneath the statements. There are 10 proof texts underneath this question, and they're all good and all relevant. But it's strange to me that Hosea 6 uh, was not one of them. It was just strange to me because it is such a clear call to repentance. And what made it even more strange is that The catechism's definition here, uh, having a true sense of sin and awareness of God's mercy, uh, having grief and hatred of your sin and turning with a full purpose for new obedience, every single part of that definition is found inside these verses that we're looking at. Every single part. In other words, uh, just as the answer to the question in the catechism is comprehensive. So, in fact, these verses are comprehensive too. Just these few verses, they cover everything that repentance really means. Now, with these things in mind, let's just um, um, look at this a little more deeply. The catechism mentioned there that we turn to God from a sense of two things sense of two things. We turn to God because we have a true sense of sin, and we turn to God because we have an apprehension, uh, an awareness that God is merciful in Christ. Let's take these two uh, things in turn. First of all, a, a true sense of sin, a sinner out of a true sense of his sin. Not just any sense of sin, uh, not some sense of sin. It doesn't even say a true sense of sin, but a true sense of his sin. So if you're going to turn to God, or if I am, you need to have, as I do, a true sense of your sin and me of mine. A genuine sense of our own sin. Now, where do we find that in our scripture text here? Well, you find it again in the last verse of chapter 5, where God says, after he tears them like a lion, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their offense. Now, if you're using this version of the Bible, the New King James Version, you'll notice a little numeral beside the word for, beside the word acknowledge there. It should be the numeral four, which puts you into the margin of your Bible, where it says literally, become guilty or bear punishment. Let's take become guilty. In other words, the Hebrew can be translated like this. I will return again to my place until they become guilty of their offense. Now, what a flood of light that puts on the whole thing. I mean, in one respect, they are guilty of the offence. There's no denying that. They have sinned. They removed the landmarks 
They willingly walked by human commandments in worship and in life. They're guilty of all that. That's why God tore them. So the meaning of become guilty of their offense is obviously them realizing it. Them being aware of their own guilt and them acknowledging their own guilt. That's why it's translated acknowledge here until until they own it. In other words, that's how we would describe it today, today, till they own their offense and become aware of their guilt. In other words, they're convicted of it. To be convicted of sin is to be convinced that you are a sinner, convinced of it. And that actually takes in quite a lot. Really acknowledging your offense is not as easy as you may think it to be, especially when the devil has a vested interest in trying to keep you from it. To really acknowledge your offense or to be genuinely convinced of your sin means certainly that you believe that the thing itself was a sin. And it's amazing how you can describe it in other ways to lessen it. It's an infirmity or it's a weakness or it's a failing. No, it's a sin. To acknowledge your sin also means that You believe yourself to be truly responsible for it. Even if others were involved in it, still to really acknowledge your sin means that you yourself are to blame for it. And you alone. You alone. It also means that the punishment that God gave you or the chastisement that he sent you away was deserved. You're never again going to repent from something. If if you believe that God oversaw a chastisement, which you think was not fair. Because although you may gripe and complain about it, your gripe and your complaint will be against God because he oversaw that chastisement. He saw your sin and he saw fit that your sin be placed under this discipline. So it needs the conviction that the chastisement was deserved. And all that is involved in becoming guilty of our offense, or as the catechism put it, having a true sense of our sin. And isn't it interesting that not only this passage and the catechism tie up with that, but so does the psalm that we sang. When David after nine months of real pain and anguish in in body and soul, when this psalm came from his lips and from his heart, he's not slow to confess that what he did was a sin. He calls it just in in the space of a few verses, and this is not um, just variation of poetry. It's very, very deliberate. He calls it his iniquity. He calls it his sin. He calls it his transgression, and he calls it his evil. He's using every term possible to describe the evil of what he did, because that, that's how he feels about it. That's how he feels about it. Wash me, he says, from my iniquity. For my transgressions I confess my sin I ever see. It's a sin. Call it. Name it. Shame yourself in naming it yourself. And as well as naming it like that, he acknowledges that he alone was responsible for it. Now, I'm quite sure, as I've said to you before, because we we did look at this psalm itself in some detail, I'm quite sure he spent those nine months blaming different people, as as we can all do. We We all do that. It's very easy to blame Bathsheba, exceptionally easy to do that. It was easy for him to blame his circumstances, that he happened to be where he was and she happened to be where she was. And of course, blaming your circumstance is blaming your providence. Blaming your providence is blaming the one who gave you your providence. In other words, you are blaming God. God tempted you and therefore you sinned. Now, you would recoil from saying it like that, but that's what you're saying. If you are blaming your circumstances, oh, well, Here I was, and here she was, and I was overcome. Uh, I couldn't help it in that situation. 
In other words, if God hadn't put me there, it wouldn't have happened. That's an old excuse. It was the first one Adam reached for, the woman whom you gave me. She tempted me, and I did eat. The woman whom you gave me, she tempted me, and I did eat. But in the psalm, all that's gone. When the chastisement of God really does its work, everyone else just drops out of sight. It's you and a holy God. It's a holy God and you. My iniquity, I confess, my sin I ever see. It is my transgression. He takes ownership of it. He doesn't just call it for what it is in its evil before God, but it's mine, mine. And again, you'll notice in the same psalm that David justifies God for the chastisement that he sent. Nine months of agony of soul and spirit. Oh, yes, he says, but there was nothing wrong with that. I deserved a lot more. Against thee, he says, thee only have I sinned. In thy sight done this evil. Listen to this, that when thou speakest, in other words, when you give your sentence, thou mayest be just and clear in judging. When you give your judgment, you are clear. Clear of any accusation of severity. Clear of any accusation of injustice. Clear in judging still. David doesn't say, well, that was too hard. He doesn't say that was too heavy, but I deserved it. And you were right to bring that upon me. Now, all that is involved in having a true sense of sin. So repentance unto life is a saving grace, whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin, and not only a true sense of his sin, but you'll notice it goes on to say, with grief and hatred of his sin. Grief and hatred of his sin. And surely we can identify with that. Um, when, when the chastisement of God works in you, you begin to hate what took you under it. Uh, just as the chastisement of God vindicates God in the chast chastisement and vindicates God for sending it, so that chastisement works in you a hatred for what took you there in the first place. How sorry you are for it and how you loathe it. You, you come to that. Now, you're not necessarily there at the beginning, but you come to it. You're sorry for it and you loathe it. And why are you sorry for it? Why do you loathe it? Is it because it brought anguish into your life? No. Well, maybe partly that, but only secondarily that. And a very distant second at that. The reason you're sorry for it and you loathed it is, is because it offended God, your Savior. Because it nailed the Lord Jesus Christ to a tree. And there's no getting away from that. All our sins, individualized, personalized, nailed our Savior to the tree. You cannot take any of your sins out of that, they were all instrumental in nailing him to the tree. And the more you appreciate the love of God, uh, the more you hate yourself for having forsaken him and offended him and offended the Savior and grieved the Holy Spirit. You're sorry for it and you loathe it. And I can tell you when David penned this psalm, how he hated what he did and how he wished he had never done it. And it's easy for me to believe, and it's almost impossible for me to believe otherwise, that, that it was always with him. And the closer he got to God in the rest of his life, the more he hated that sin, the sin that separated him from God, and the sin that brought such dishonor upon God uh, in his life. He hated it, but that's a good thing. Uh, it's a strange thing, repentance, because it's so bittersweet. It's so bittersweet. Well, then you turn from God, first of all, out of a true sense of your sin. But second, you, you turn to God from a sense of the mercy of God in Christ. 
And there I'm, I'm taking this from the Catechism again. A sinner out of a true sense of his sin and then apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ. You've got to be aware of that. And you had to be aware of that in the Old Testament days as well as in the New. Even then, under the Old Covenant, God was only merciful in Christ. Now, <clears throat> although I put it like that, I'm catching myself because to say that God's only merciful in Christ can be a little bit misleading because it seems to imply that mercy is not somehow intrinsic to God uh, except for Christ, which is, is not what's meant. Uh, mercy is inherent in God. It belongs to him, essentially. But it's channeled through Christ. And it's only accessible to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's the way back to God. But the mercy is in God's own heart. God himself is merciful. And he channels us, channels that to us as sinners, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and we access that mercy of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I mean by saying that he's merciful in Christ to us. And that's why the sacrifice of blood was always at the heart of worship. Even when they worshipped in their local synagogues without a sacrifice, every single Sabbath, they were to understand the sacrifice as being there. Without blood, there was no remission of sin. They knew that, even when the bloody sacrifice was not in front of them. They knew it. With the eye of faith, they beheld it, that God was only accessible. His mercy could only be touched and reached through the mercy seat, through the blood of sprinkling that spoke better things than that of Abel, because it cries, mercy. Peace, mercy, peace. Now, as I mentioned, this sense of God being merciful towards you is what makes repentance actually possible in the first place. It's what makes your repentance evangelical repentance, gospel repentance. It's what makes it living repentance, as the prophet here says, uh, that we may live in his sight as opposed to a legal repentance or a dead repentance, the kind of repentance that just reforms. It's a simple reformation. It's an external changing of your ways. That, that gets you nothing. It's profitable in some ways to amend your ways. Of course it is. But in terms of reconciliation to God, it's, it's nothing. Repentance is a deep thing. It goes into the heart. It's touching the very well springs of your life. It's a heart thing. And it's this sense that God is merciful that makes worship possible. It makes repentance possible. And we're going to sing Psalm 130 at the close, but we read it earlier. And uh, in these famous words in Psalm 130, uh, the psalmist says, Yet with the forgivenesses that feared thou mayest be. Or there is forgiveness with you that you may be held in reverence. There's forgiveness with you that you may be held in reverence or even that you may be worshipped with reverence and with godly fear. Who could worship God if, if he wasn't forgiving? Be impossible. Impossible. If thou, O Lord, shouldst mark iniquity, who should stand? Yet with thee forgiveness is that feared or worshipped thou mayest be. And uh, we come tonight even to the throne of grace like that because we know God's merciful. I mean, if, if he wasn't, how dare you come to worship God? I mean, who are we tonight to call upon the name of the Lord unless God was merciful? Goodies. What possible standing would we have tonight in the presence of God? But here, you see, real repentance means not only that you have a true sense of your own sin, but you have an overwhelming sense 
that if you call upon his name, he will receive you, unworthy as you are. You believe that if you call upon his name and ask him to receive you, if you seek his face and say, turn towards me, Lord, and look upon me and receive me in your favor, you believe that he will. It's not an attempt to twist God's arm to do something that he doesn't want to do. It's just a, a simple willingness on our part and a humble, a humble reception of his free grace, which you see is yours in Christ Jesus. And you find that in the psalm too. When David pens this psalm, there is anguish in it. You, you can certainly feel that there's, there's so much pain and recollection of what he's done and so much sorrow for it. But the psalm itself isn't a shot in the dark. It, it isn't a kind of plaintive hope that maybe, maybe he might be accepted. It's, it's not an unintelligent emotional cry. It's actually grounded in the mercy and in the character of God. In all his pain, he's got a deep grasp of this, that there's a good reason to cry to him, because he is merciful and because he is gracious. We sang that in the morning. The Lord is gracious, slow to wrath, and plenteous in mercy. I mean, listen to how he opens the psalm. After thy loving kindness, Lord, have mercy upon me. Now, just switch that round. Switch it round. Have mercy upon me according to your loving kindness. That makes it more plain, does it not? Have mercy upon me according to your loving kindness because, or, or covenant love, this is who you are. For thy compassion's great. Blot out all my iniquity. Turn that one around too. Blot out all my iniquity for thy compassion's great. I am laying hold upon what I know of your compassion. The great when you receive sinners to yourself. And how precious should that be to you tonight uh, if you're not a believer and if God has been nibbling away at your life like a moth or maybe he's even torn it apart recently like a lion. How precious this should be if you're reaching out to God for the first time and there's something uncertain in your life as to whether God will actually accept you or whether God can receive you for whatever reason. Well, forget it. Lay hold of this intelligent understanding of the nature and compassion of a covenant-keeping God whose heart is full of love and who's willing to receive According to your loving kindness, be merciful. According to your great passion, compassion, blot out all my iniquity. And as a Christian, if you're reaching out to God for the hundredth time, or if God has somehow dealt with you severely too, or bitterly, as Naomi said when she came out of Moab, having suffered much there, the Almighty has dealt bitterly with her. She said, well, if you reaching out to God, reach out to him like this too. He's not weary in forgiving. He's not tired in forgiving. All God desires is your repentance. And every time he sees it, there is nothing as precious to him as that. The repentant tear in the sinner's eye. And every time he sees it, he can't refrain himself. He cannot possibly restrain himself. When the prodigal son makes his way to the father, he has a speech rehearsed about all that he's done wrong and he wants to apologize to the father, but the father just throws his arms around his neck because he is glad to receive him. Glad to receive him. Don't ever doubt that your repentance will be accepted by God. Don't be tempted to believe it will be rejected. And uh, you'll notice that the passage here in the prophecy is full of God's healing. It's, it's full of the promise of God's healing. And these people who are saying to each other, come and let us return to the Lord, they're so persuaded of what God's going to do for them. Um, 
the persuaded of it, he, he will certainly come. He will certainly come. We're told, for example, well, you have it in, in verse 1, he has torn, but he will heal us. Uh, he has um, stricken, but he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. He will, he will, he will, he will. In fact, uh, midway through verse 3, we're told that his going forth is established like the morning. His, his going forth. Now, that's his going forth from his place. He, he came forth from his place to visit in judgment. He returned to his place to leave us in our affliction. Now his going forth to heal and to help us is established as the morning. What does that mean? Well, there's nothing as sure as the morning, is there? I mean, it just always comes. It always comes as the thing that follows the night. God has set that order in place, night follows morning. Well, just as surely as he's appointed the morning to follow the night, so he's appointed forgiveness to follow repentance. That's it. It's as certain as that. Of course, it carries the idea too, every single idea that morning carries of beauty and freshness and origin and beginnings, it, healings. It, it carries all that too, but it's the certainty of the thing. His going forth is established as the morning. God will surely come. That's it. It's certain. His healing is certain. And you can be persuaded of that, and you must be persuaded of that. You'll notice, too, that God turns to us quickly when we turn to him. Come and let us return to the Lord. He has torn, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. Now, I think uh, it is a mysterious thing, but I think the resurrection of Christ is in there. Um, but that's for another time. On the face of it, the teaching is more simple than that. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up. Um, that is essentially saying, just two short days, that's all it is. It's a short space of time. And after that's passed, there's a revivification. There's a resurrection and a raising up. It's, it's like a resurrection because he brings us back to himself. He brings us back to the joy we had, the gladness we had, everything that we had before we broke off, bro broke off our fellowship. And it was we who broke it off, not, not him. He brings us back to that, just two short days. And then we're revived and we are raised up on our feet. And we are back to who we were. So it's quick. It's as though God's in a hurry to restore this relationship. And I don't mean to be irreverent by, and you'll understand it's just a way of speaking, but there is a kind of holy haste in God uh, for this to be put right. A holy haste in God. I remember once um, when my father chastised me rather severely. And of course, I remember it because of the severity of it, sad to say. But um, I remember how after a while I was so keen to be reconciled to my father. And it didn't cross my mind that my father was keen to be reconciled to me. In fact, maybe I was worried about it. But my father, of course, was, was indeed keen to be reconciled to me. But, but that is the way that God is. It's in his sight, like two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up. He'll come quickly. You turn to God like the prodigal, and God will come quickly to you and put his arms, as it were, around your neck. Your neck. You'll notice, too, that God's coming isn't just certain and quick. It's also abundant. It's abundant. Uh, we're told at the end of verse 3, that his going forth to you is established as the morning, and it's also like the rain, the latter and the former rain upon the earth. 
the, there were two rains in Israel. And they were both necessary for the harvest. The first rain, the first heavy rain, came in autumn time. That was the former rain. The latter rain came in the springtime. One was given at the beginning of the season for the planting. The other was at the time of harvest, and it quickly brought the fruit to ripening. Now, the real meaning here is that God will make us fruitful. Um, an abundant latter and former rain. In other words, the Lord wants to restore us to what we were, and he will. Um, we will have learned something. Um, we may indeed lose something, but we will also be abundant in his, in his labor. And God will, as he said through Joel, restore the years that the locust has eaten. Isn't that wonderful too? Because the locust was eating. Well, is, isn't the locust a little like a moth? Of course, it's <laughs> more destructive, but it's the same idea that the Lord restores here the years that the locust has eaten. So he's going to make us fruitful too. He comes abundantly. He doesn't come reluctant. I mean, that's maybe how we would accept uh, our repentance. A little reluctantly, but there's nothing reluctant in the heart of God. His heart is straining, as it were, to to be with us as we were before. As we were before. And if if we really have this sense of God's mercy in Christ, if we're not just fleeing sin, but if you're actually embracing God through your Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, You'll also have what the Catechism says, a full purpose of and an endeavor after new obedience. You're not going to come home the person you were. You're not content to put off the old man. You want to put on the new man. And you'll notice that even that's in the text too. Um, After the call to repentance here in verse 1, come and let us return to the Lord. He has torn, but he will heal. He has struck, but he will bind. After two days, he'll revive us. On the third day, he'll raise us up that we may live in his sight and be fruitful. Then he says this, let us know. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. Now, what's this really, but essentially what the catechism spoke of there, a full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. He's not simply after a reconciliation. This person. He doesn't simply want Israel and uh, Judah to be reconciled. He, he wants to know and to pursue the knowledge of God. And the knowledge of the God is not to be understood there as a merely intellectual knowledge. Of course, that's not left out. It can never be left out. But it has all the Hebrew ideas of intimacy and relationship. Let us pursue the knowledge of God. The intimate knowledge of God. Uh, Let's add to our faith. Let's grow in grace. Let's grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pursue the knowledge of the Lord. That's what repentance is. It, It just wants to serve the Lord and to honor the Lord. You know, I'm conscious that, um, I've said much, especially this morning, I'm conscious I overloaded it a bit and uh, tonight too. But if you are in affliction and if you're conscious that the Lord himself has has worked in you like a moth or like a lion, then seek his face. Um, Then they will seek my face. face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. In other words, get back into a right relationship because God will welcome you into it and with an abundance of good things he will satisfy your mouth now i want to close uh, just by reading a passage from the word of god and it's from this prophet itself and it's perhaps an even better known passage of repentance uh, than the one i've looked at with you but when we read it i want you to read it taking with you as much as you can of what we've looked at today and the past Lord's Day. Turn to chapter 14 of the book, and we'll read the 
opening seven verses in conclusion. This will refer to Assyria. It will refer to looking to false selves and finding the true help in God. Let's read it. Hosea 14. Listen to these wonderful words. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you. Isn't that beautiful? Speak to him. Take words with you and return to the Lord and say to him, take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. We will praise you. Listen to this. Assyria shall not save us. The broken world. We will not ride on horses, no no attempt at war or political alliances. Neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods. For in you the fatherless finds mercy. And then hear God, hear God. I will heal their backsliding. Isn't that wonderful? I will love them freely. For my anger has turned away from him. I will be like the Jew to Israel. How refreshing is that in the morning? He shall grow like the lily and lengthen his roots like Lebanon, strong, deep-rooted tree. His branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance to God, to God, shall be like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall be revived like grain and grow like wine, like a vine. Their scent shall be like the scent, wine of Lebanon. Ephraim shall say, what have I to do any more with idols? And so on. It's all there. It's all there. How worth it repentance is when that's the reward when that's what God gives to the repentant sinner, come and let us return to the Lord.